You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live every Friday at 1.30 p.m. Central, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike Options Pricing and Analysis Software. QuickStrike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. Quick Strike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. That's B A N T I X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Quick Strike One. That's Q U I K S T R I K E One. This week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options. Uh, well, that was my best Mark Longo imitation, and unfortunately, it wasn't very good. We got Mark out... Uh, with a little bit of the flu this week. So it's gonna be uh, just Nick talking here and Uncle Mike on the other line today as we go through uh, sort of a uh, uncharted territory without our, our special host, Mark Longo. So uh, do the best you can to hang on and, uh, and, and, and maybe, you'll, maybe you'll vote to kick Mark off every week. Uh, that's my hope anyway. And then we'll uh, you know, push the show forward without him. So we'll see how it goes today. So probably a little bit more unstructured because he's pretty good uh, at uh, keeping us going uh, along the outline. Whereas uh, I probably will won't be as uh, won't be as uh, um, uh, uh, measured uh, along those lines. So we're just going to run through, and I'll tell you right off the bat what we're going to try to cover. We're going to look at some oil today. We'll look at the crude oil. We'll look at gold, uh, both and silver, and uh, we'll you know, do our movers and shakers for the week and probably uh, end it with uh, quite a bit of talk about Bitcoin, which we saw the release of this week and um, and which we're going to see the release of uh, this weekend over at the CME. So uh, we might as well get started uh, on the other line as uh, in the hot seat today and, uh, and uh, you know, taking buckets and 
throwing him over the side of the boat as I sink the ship. You got Mike Dussault. How's it going, man? You want to <laughs> Pre- welcome yourself here today? <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. I like the analogy. I, I, I can, I can, I can be the bailer. That's a good thing. And then in terms of uh, uh, with Longo, um, you know, l- let's start. Let's start a good nasty rumor about him. Uh, the other day, Mark Longo he bought an option, uh, an at the money call option, and on the same strike, I'm sorry, in the same month, he bought an out of the money call option on the same underlying. Mark Longo bought a stupid the other day there. I'm going to spread a nasty rumor about him that he'll hate. <laughs> good, good God. And all we need to make that worse is if you did it a third time, right? That's, we still call that a stupid. We don't even call that, you know, a, a double stupid, but that's surprising. And uh, I believe it, you know, he talks bad about it when, uh, when we're, we are discussing it, but, uh, and I could see him doing it, especially if it's uh something he likes, but uh, anyway, it's good to have you. And thanks. Appreciate you helping us out today. It's kind of strange because, um, you hear yourself talking and you expect, you know, you, you sort of know that he's monitoring in the background, but uh, now that I know he's not monitoring, I'll just have to treat it like I'm, like I'm doing a webinar. So um, hopefully we'll get to get to the point where I feel a little bit more comfortable and gradually we'll start to get there. Anyway, let's, uh, let's just sort of look uh, I don't know about you, Mike, it seemed like a pretty kind of meh week in terms of just movement across the board. You know, if we start out with our crude oil, you know, there's, there was news over the last couple of weeks and nothing really moved the market. Um, so when we go out here and look, and, and again, as we mentioned all the time, semigroup.com slash twifo, uh, the reports are live right now. So anything that you hear us talking about, you'll be able to click on the same links as us. So go out there if you can, if you're listening live, and if you are listening after the fact, you could go out there and see the report. You'll have to look at uh, this week, if you look at it uh, today or tomorrow, meaning Friday or Saturday, or you have to look at last week if you start uh, looking at the report while you're listening to the show as well. So we'll just jump right in. And, you know, we had January expire yesterday and the contracts for uh, for the crude oil. But all in all, Mike, I don't know about you, kind of uh, not, not much of a week in terms of movement in that underlying or a lot of activity from an open interest and trade standpoint, but but not a lot going on in terms of, you know, the market moving itself. No, I would agree with you for sure. It seems to me that just in looking at a chart accrued about a month ago, uh, we got to the 59 level and we couldn't quite, uh, I think it was uh, November, late November, uh, we got to the 59 level in crude uh, for the light sweet crude. We couldn't quite cross the 60 mark. And uh, the I guess if you're an oil bull, the good part about that would be the fact that we're just kind of staying there uh, for the time being. It really has kind of been uh, pretty much a channel between the in the upper 50s. See, it's gone to the support level around the 56. Um, but just still has not been able to cross the 60 mark in terms of the light sweet crude. Um, you know, the couple things that do surprise me out of this, um, the fact that we have some just just over the course of the last few weeks, some world events. Um, first one is the fact that we now have uh, Jerusalem is going to be the news that Jerusalem is going to be the new capital of Israel or it's going to be recognized as the capital of Israel uh, by the United States. Uh, just with all the threats of terrorism and things like that, uh, it did kind of surprise me a little bit that we didn't get a little bit more of a bump up in oil from that. Or, uh, um, And along with the fact that it just seems that we have a lot of macro world news that's happening right now, just not necessarily this past week per se, but just over the last few months. I talk about this on uh, the option block a lot, a joke that I used to tell to my clients, or not a joke, but I was very serious about it, was if I'd get a new client and they'd send in their money, and then once the money went through the transfer process and the money would be in the account, I would tell them, okay, uh, everything's all set. Tomorrow, I'll put your money to work, unless, of course, we have like a threat of a nuclear war or something like that tonight, and then I won't do it. Um, but we have threats of nuclear war. Uh, we have uh, threats of a lot of things that are happening throughout the world. We have a totally new tax plan that's going to come into play. We're totally we're getting rid of the individual mandate on Obamacare. We're getting we have uh, a lot of things going on, and not only just in the crude oil space, but just with silver and gold in general. Uh, we really it's going to take a lot to move any market. It seems. Yeah, you know, I would tend to agree with that just from the standpoint of it's it's very reactionary, right? When you, I think the last time we saw a, a significant break in the S&Ps, uh, we saw a rush. We saw gold get pumped pretty good. But then it sort of tapers off. So it's like everybody it, – it's almost like people's uh, digestion of the news cycle is very much – 
well, it, for lack of a better term, it's like Twitter, right? You see it, you get hyped up, you might react. And then as the next line of uh, news comes out or the next uh, uh, less noteworthy thing, you just sort of go back into your regular kind of pattern of things. So it just seems like we're, you know, it's, and, and even to some of the things that the, you know, that our president has said and the reactions to those things and, and, the, and the other news, we're just sort of chewing it up, reacting a little bit, and then kind of going back in the status quo. And I think that that is a little bit disturbing, right? Because it doesn't seem like everybody's taking things into account. And, and you, you mentioned the tax plan. I mean, that we, we st you know, there's been some good articles out there that talked about who it's going to affect and who it's going to benefit. And I think if people really start to go even looking at that thing, there, there might be a, a bigger reaction in the market when they start to see how little of the people it's supposed to help it. It's really helping. So CNN's got a really good tax calculator on there where you can, you know, put your revenue and what, what state you're in and it'll tell you sort of your benefits over the years. So I think people should go look at that. And I, I think that, you know, we have to be maybe less immune to the to the shocking news than we are and start really trying to put all the pieces together because you're exactly right. We have all this big news going on, but it just seems like it's, you know, it, it you take the gut punch and you sort of weather that and then the next thing you know, you move on to the next thing. It's our attention span may not be where it should be uh, in terms of uh, in terms of this, you know, economic climate, you know, political climate, all those kind of things. Anyway, so just, you know, jumping over to crude, we look, we have a pretty flat week, right? We, 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 we bounced around a little bit. It didn't do much in terms of the futures price. And with that, we saw uh, the front month volatility get hammered pretty good. So we're down trading front month. Uh, February contract is trading 17 and a quarter, down two and a half vol, you know, March down to uh, – almost 19 vol. So across the board. So that front month is really that, that the term structure really got steep uh, this week uh, with, uh, again, another week of no movement. And and I would agree with what you said in terms of, and you're going to know better than me in terms of the ranges and the and, and the setup for where the underlying should go. But we when we can't hit these sort of these uh, significant numbers, right? We're, we're just sort of, I think we've moved our, our trend lines in between the 55 and the 60. So until until we do anything on either side of that, it's, we're, I think we're in for this, you know, sort of the, the same thing here. We're going to grind through and uh, get have volatility get softer. Our front contract right now, if we don't take the weeklies into account, has 33 days and it's trading 17 and a quarter vol. So we're talking, you know, a fairly low volatility um, in, in a contract that's got, you know, we're going to, it's going to take us through the new year. So, uh, so that in and of itself is significant. You know, if we go back and, you know, we, I'm going to work my way across the TWIFL report and look at the, we took the, we look at the futures price. We'll look at the, at the money volatility. Now, if we look at the quick skew or the risk reversal uh, again, puts, you know, not much change in a week. I think calls got a little less cheap, but if we look at the quick skew historically from the 30 day contract, since that relates best to the 33 days that we have in the February, um, all in all, we're, we're, we're right about the average of where the puts and the calls have been trading. So, um, you know, we're sort of moving in, e even long term, we're sort of moving into sort of an average range in terms of the expectation of what the vol curve looks like. So not a big significant change there. Like I said, puts a little bit more, uh, um, well, a little, I'm sorry, a little less firm than they have been, but not a significant change. And the call's a little less cheap. So maybe a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of a help in terms of uh, making the calls come back in line uh, with the puts, but but not anything significantly uh, different than it was, about maybe a, a, a vol percent is all. And then as far as the trade goes, uh, you know, increased open interest almost 9%. We saw January go off the board yesterday, so February got a big bump, 18.5% uh, increase in, in open interest, and uh, pretty good volume numbers this week, almost uh, uh, over half a million contracts, at least in the, uh, um, in, you know, we're, when we generally speaking right now, we're looking at the front year of, of, uh, of expiration, so most of that volume coming in the first uh, calendar year for the, uh, for the crude options. And then movers and shakers this week, you know, again, um, as you mentioned, we're, we're, we're in this range. We can't really uh, jump past the 60 right now. But if we look out on the term structure, we see a lot of 70 calls trading. So I can look just as the most active volumes for this week on the uh, on the this week in futures options report. We see a 65 strike in March having the most volume, the 70 strike in April, the 70 strike in May, the 75 strike in June with 10,000 out there, the 70 strike in July. Um, and then we jump out to the next uh, October had a 75 strike. November had a 75 strike and the December had a 75 strike. So, so Mike, what do you think about that? We saw a lot of upside, um, 
purchasing in the crude. So are, are we are we finally getting people? Are people saying I'm I'm selling those to finance something a little closer? Or do you think that people are starting to look? Well, I'm going to take my chance and see where things go. Relating back to what you said about some of the uncertainty that's going on in uh, in the market with some of the political stuff. I would say, you know, logically speaking, I mean, my personal opinion on crude oil, I don't really see it going up to the 75 level in the time frames with which you mentioned. Uh, typically, I'm more of an S&P guy, but uh, just in following crude like I do, I don't know if we're going to get that kind of movement in that time frame. So um, I would like to, if it were me, I would probably be more along the lines of selling those calls to finance something else, whether I'm looking to... Um, finance another call spread and a, and a ratio of some sort or uh, financing a hedge or something along those lines, that would probably be more of what I would be doing. But um, if we do have the optimism and crude uh, that people are thinking maybe somewhere down the line, we could get something to happen, it would not surprise me. But I would say the more logically speaking, uh, it would probably be more of a financing play because that's, that is gonna, that's close to a 20% move in crude oil. Uh, in that time frame, and so um, I would I would be more along the I would be more apt to believe that that's more of a financing play, to say the least. Yeah, and 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 if if you click on the links in the most active columns, you can see that uh, several of the months have openings in there. So if we see some of those five thousands, maybe a strip, or maybe it's some sort of like a calendar condor or something like that that traded. But I would tend to agree with that. I I don't like. There are a lot better plays, especially when you're looking at how low the volatility is, right? You can really get some 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 calls that are very close to the money right now, almost for a zero, right? Or for a credit with a simple one by two. Um, you know, if you look at the 60 and you go out up up a little bit higher, you can you have a lot of room on the upside for a move, and before you get in trouble and you're paying nothing. So I would tend to think that that's probably what's going on. And again, I, I didn't pay too much attention to the crew to see how uh, this week in terms of the block to see if those things traded on the block or if they were, or if they were uh, on Globex themselves. But, but uh, always, you know, the one thing we look at week after week is, you know, sort of the higher strikes that are trading um, and especially the higher strikes that are trading out on the calendar. So this is probably uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is probably the most months that we've seen something like you mentioned, almost 20% out trade so um, consistently across the whole term structure. So that's something we'll have to watch and I'll have to go back and take a look. So I'm a little bit better informed next week when we do a, a recap of, uh, of what we saw uh, today. Um, so let's, uh, let's go from the, you know, the black gold over to our, our, uh, precious metal, our regular gold and, and, and give that a little look. And, and this is probably, you know, for, for somebody who was a rage trader and uh, didn't have much uh, experience when it came to the, came to the commodity market, this is, this has become, I, I like WTI now, Mike, and, uh, but I, I really like gold now. And I, I don't know if it's because it's something tangible and physical that you can, that, you know, you can get in your hands and, 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 and it, and it's a, a you know, it's a store of value and all that kind of thing, but I've, I've enjoyed following it and, and I, and I like watching it quite a bit. And I think we're in some really oddball territory just from a guy who's traded options and just from watching this market over, uh, as long as we've been doing this show, um, let's just jump right in and, and, and say we have, we'll, you know, tend to look at stuff. If, if there's less than a couple of weeks in an expiration, I tend to say, okay, we're not going to talk too much about that one. But I think what's significant here is we have 11 day option in the January contract, Mike. And you know, you know how, you know how it goes as you get closer to expiration, you tend to see the volatility sort of kick up, right? Because the decays, the K kicks in and people want to keep that price around the same, same level. So they push the volatility up. Um, but what we see today or this week, we see the January contract, it's in almost one, in, it's over one and three quarter volatility. So the front contract is trading 7%, okay? And and we have a little bit of a retracement down from our, our, our near-term, you know, our near-term lows in gold around 20, about the 1248, 1245, something like that from where we touched. I think that might've been where we touched up to about the 1258 and a half. But to come in one and three quarters on a front contract that's going to lose two days over the weekend, right? Typically, you'd see a little bit of a boost potentially. So if we see this, I mean, you're you're basically saying, I don't think anything's going to go on in this front contract for the next 10 days, which encompasses all the next week and then part of the following week, or I think we'll even get through Christmas on this one. Yeah, 1226, you get the day after Christmas. So 
have you have you seen that before? What do you think of seeing something so so depressed like that with with I, I get it. It's under 14 days, but you know, you know what I mean? You typically see that, that term structure get pulled up. What, what are your thoughts there? Well, I, I think this is just seems to be across the board, even in the, on the equity side of things uh, as well is that uh, if, if the world events that we've had don't make this move, then I don't know what will. Um, the only, the only other theory that I have on this, uh, and this is something we were talking about on the option block yesterday is that, uh, um, this other thing that came out, uh, oh, I forget what it's called. Uh, I know we're going to talk about today. Um, <laughs> Fit, Bitcoin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Right. Yeah. Um, for years and years and years, um, I, I'm, I have exposure to uh, uh, precious metals for my clients. And I'm one of the few financial advisors who uh, really believes in that, not for a huge section of their portfolio, but definitely I think you need to have uh, exposure, not necessarily for everybody, but for a lot of people. Uh, and then one thing that I've noticed through, and I, I do hedge them with collars, and I talk about that on the option block frequently, but one thing that I was just noticing the other day is that when uh, we hit the peak of gold and silver, uh, or at least the peak for uh, my time in the business anyway, and for a lot of people's time in the business, uh, in April of 2011, uh, shortly thereafter, and I, I remember uh, when silver was up in the 40s, and I believe the Merck actually uh, had to raise the margin requirement on it, uh, rightfully so, just because the contract just got so much bigger overnight. Um, when that happened, uh, that was around the time, and I was just kind of doing some looking at this, and we can talk about this when we talk about Bitcoin in a little bit. Um, that was when Bitcoin was just starting out. And so just a theory that um, I just had, some, we had a conversation on this yesterday was that uh, could Bitcoin, the people that were believing in the zombie apocalypse, so to speak, the gold and silver zealots that uh, believe that that's the only thing that's going to be worth anything someday, could they have switched from gold and silver to Bitcoin? Uh, that's one theory. Now, uh, with gold having such low vol like that, um, you could argue and make the case that maybe it actually deserves to have such low vol uh, just because of the fact that the movement that is in it uh, recently really is not that much, but uh, with the number that you're saying and you're quoting, uh, that almost seems to be a little bit low even for uh, what's happening. Uh, so with that being said, I guess the long and short of it is, is that that uh, is a very unique number. And uh, uh, I guess uh, traders aren't expecting too much to be happening in the next few days. Yeah. And, you know, Mark and I, when you've been on the show, you've heard us talk about this. So, People always talk about you know low vol environment. They can't trade a low vol environment, and there's not much to trade because people tend to think of volatility and more so, at least from my background, people always want to sell volatility, right? To get some premium to, or at least have a chance to, uh, you know, you weren't going out there looking to buy a high volatility. You're always looking to sort of sell a, a high volatility. But you know, I, I looked at the ranges that these, that these volatility levels should encompass, and and um, and and we are trading those ranges, right? So it feel it feels like you should be able to, you know, get get some of your money back on the gamma. And I'm always pushing uh, in low vol environment. I'm always pushing these hedged gamma trades because I think you don't need much uh, movement in order to get some of your premium back. So, but you know, it's uh, it's interesting to think that that we would be making a shift in a uh, store of value from gold to something that. I don't think a lot of people understand, but we'll we'll get to that um, when we when we do finally breach the the Bitcoin topic. But you know, if we just go through and start looking at our our gold uh, twifold report here, we're going to see right across the board on the volatilities. And um, you know, even our 40-day contract is uh, almost eight and a half percent. Our 90 or our 70 our 70-day contract is nine and a quarter, and our 100-day contract is uh, is um, you know, under 10%. So we're seeing a significant part all the way out to, uh, well, actually all the way out through December is under 12%. So we are, we are on lows and, and, and I agree, right? The vol is low. You know, people always say can vol go, vol can't go much lower. Well, it can always go lower if we're, if we're not doing much or if we're trending, um, or if there's, like you said, news is being absorbed and, and not really changing uh, the vol perspective, then we can continue to see it. But I got to tell you, at 7%, um, you know, you just got to think at some point, when, what I start to do here is start to look at where we are in the range and start to decide what I can do that's going to take advantage of this range at this low volatility. So it'll be interesting. Again, always a lot of good stuff to watch. 
and and it may not make people happy that volatility is so low, but when 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 it does change, it's going to change rather quickly, and that part is going to for me that's always fun uh, to see how people react and for how long that spike uh, is going to occur. So you got to believe it's coming at some point. But you know if we go out here and look, we we you know again work our way across the Twifold report, not much of a change in skew, um, but you know one thing that's sort of significant. If you go down and look, you're seeing the, the puts are really flat to the, at the money. Um, so that's our quick skew number. So we don't, we, we see a lot of zeros or close to zeros. So just a little bit expensive or a little bit uh, cheap, but generally speaking around. So we're talking about from the 50 Delta to the 25 Delta, we're seeing those, um, we're seeing those uh, put spreads trade ab about equal levels from a volatility standpoint. So, you know, those, there's a lot of opportunity there just when you see sort of uh, um, uh, flatness between the wings and the at the money. So there are some, for me, at least from in my history, there is some, there's some tradeability there in terms of spreads and hedge spreads and different kind of things like that. And uh, the calls, you know, we saw over the course of the week, we saw them get uh, much less, uh, expensive to the at the money. So across the board, we saw the volatility come in. So that partially is the fact that we moved back in or in toward or toward our upper part or the middle part of our trading range. So we have a, a very kind of a big belly in this vol curve. So not too expensive, uh, not expensive at all on the put side and then not too expensive <laughs> on the call side. And the reality is there is uh, when you're talking at such a low volatility and you're talking a percent rich or cheap, it's really almost no difference at all from a vol standpoint. But with all that said and done, open interest again up 6%. So we're almost have a million contracts in open interest in the gold. So, you know, this, this low, um, this low vol uh, tight range isn't really affecting us from an open interest standpoint or a trade interest. So what do you think is happening there, Mike, with, with, with the trade still and the open interest still being supported? Well, I think that it's the fact that I, even the buyers and the sellers are there. I mean, it's it's hard to say with that. I mean, it's just what's surprising. I think it's just a very surprising scenario to say the least. Um, the but I guess not necessarily the option side being so surprising, but just you know, I'm looking at a one year chart of um, of uh, the gold futures, and uh, there's really not a lot of movement on it. So I mean, you know, what is this telling us? It's hard to say, but. Uh, I think just like to allude to what you had said, um, we're waiting for something to happen, um, but it just needs to happen. Right. And that's, uh, you know, and, and that's really, that's really the, the obvious question at this point, right? It's like, what's going to happen or what can you do in the meantime? Right. So people obviously aren't sitting on the sidelines and again, we'll address what's trading and, and that type of thing, but, uh, it's what you can do in the meantime. And for me, when, when, when you're rangy, I think there's, uh, you know, there's short trades you can do, even if vol is low, you can pick some wide strikes and sell some premium as a strangle, or you can start trying to buy, you know, you know, look at vol and forget it about it as vol and think about it as gamma. So, uh, it's, uh, it's one of, and, and what I've been pushing, Mike, uh, I don't know if you've, uh, uh, listened to some of the shows or even the shows you've been on in this range. I, I, I like, I like hedge stuff. I like buying puts and buying futures down on the bottom side and like buying calls and selling futures up on the top. So it's like a collar. Or no, it's a well. It's basically a, it's a it's a what do I call it? It's a split strangle almost. It's a you know you're buying you're buying both and you're hedging both separately. So um, I just uh, I think that there's opportunity there without a lot of movement, and I still continue to think that, especially as we move down uh, into these vol levels. Um, as far as uh, our trade uh, this week, you know, not anything really tremendously outside of our trade range. We see some some 1750s and some 1600s, but the volume is so insignificant that they really don't really doesn't even bother mentioning them. But a lot of our trade is in this range, our 1200 to 1300 range, and uh, and um, you know I think that that's what we're going to see, and 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 maybe and and we're we're seeing increases, so people are obviously opening positions, but we're seeing all these strikes within this 1200 to 1300 range. That's where a lot of our our activity is happening. So, um, again, vol's low. You got to keep an eye on it. I don't think, even though it's low, Mike, I don't think you can ignore it. I don't think, well, it's not going anywhere. I think when people get most 
content with volatility being either high or low, that's when the change occurs, right? So when we're when we have this, and I'll try to tweet out if, as I can uh, a historical 30-day constant maturity volatility. But when we're this low, I just got to think that something's on the horizon. Um, and you know, when you're when you're this cheap, you feel like you got to do something. So anyway, that would be kind of where I'm um, where I'm coming from. Um, but let's jump over since. Uh, you know, we, you know, you, you, we've talked about your two year silver collar when you've been on the show before. So let's jump over to silver a little bit. And I haven't really looked at the, that this week, but you want to, you want to lead the charge in terms of talking about the collars, how it's performing, what you think, would you put it on again, that kind of stuff. Well, yeah. And to, to answer your question, first off, what I put on again, absolutely. Um, with that silver has been over the course of the last year or so, kind of an exciting road to nowhere. It's down a little bit right now. It was up, uh, a bunch, but now it's down. Uh, but it's really uh, just in looking at it uh, and looking at the um, uh, the the contract for uh, silver. Uh, it's really not had a ton of movement thus far this year. I shouldn't say not a ton of movement, but it's really not had uh, quite the same movement that uh, I had hoped it would have. Um, Longo always makes fun of me in that. Uh, uh, we both thought that uh, doing being active on a collar with silver uh, would be quite the thing to do this year uh, in terms of having content for the option block, but it's uh, quite honestly been the letdown of the year for uh, option block show content. I figured I'd be doing an adjustment on this thing every week, but I think I've done like two or three adjustments thus far. Uh, I'm hedged at the 12 level on silver right now. Uh, but what I have done a couple times is I've gotten into and out of the covered call on it. And right now, recently, with silver coming down like it has, uh, kind of just open, I hate to say open to the floodgates, but uh, probably about two weeks ago, it's uh, started to really uh, come down fairly significantly. Uh, I'm hedged at the 12 level, so it's not one to where um, it's anywhere near of anything I'm concerned with at this point or need to do anything with on the put side of it at this point. Uh, the tighter collar that I have had on, um, I'm, he I'm still hedged at the 17 level. Now what I'm looking to do at this point in time for the collar that I, where I'm hedged at the 17 level, I'm looking to get to the point to where do we have enough, uh, extrinsic value bled out of the 17 puts to where I need to roll it down uh, and do something to where I can roll it down to a lower put strike, uh, underlying rallies a little bit, and then you end up being profitable even when the underlying is down. Uh, that worked out uh, recently, but uh, at some point I'd like silver to come up instead of being ahead a couple pennies when it goes down uh, 10 to 15% on the year. Uh, I'd much rather uh, be up a decent amount if it were to actually go higher. But uh, with that being said, I think that uh, what I'm kind of waiting on at this point in time. I want to see silver get a little bit more of a rally. Uh, and then I want to resell the covered call side of this trade. Um, what the rally would be, I'd want to see at least another a dollar at least before I would start even looking. Uh, but the concept behind it is that because silver typically has a reverse skew in it as compared to the S&P, um, volatility is higher on the call side of it, typically, not always. I'm sure you'll kind of address that as to what's going on with that now in a second. But the concept behind it is that if we get a rally, uh, if we get more vol on the call side on silver, then that gives me the opportunity to sell a covered call on the position uh, and allow for it uh, to take advantage of that reverse skew. Uh, that's kind of one of the areas with which I'm working on that collar at this point in time. But uh, for now, it's just uh, it's a married put position waiting for a rally to sell the covered call again. Uh, if we do come down a little bit further than uh, at least on the one where I'm hedged at 17, I want to uh, look to roll that in some way, shape or form, but uh, not quite there yet. OK, so you so you brought up two things that one of which I'm I'm familiar with the covered calls. And I think I've become more an advocate, you know, being. Being from the rate, you know, in the euro dollars, I talk about that's where that's where I learned to trade in the euro dollar option pick. We didn't, you didn't talk too much about covered calls per se, but you talked about covered calls in the equity market. And now I I like the more I learn and the more I'm just more, um, you know, well rounded in terms of what I'm paying attention to. I kind of like the covered calls. But you call them married put. So was that married put mean you put that you've got hedged? Is what you mean by that? Is that correct? Yeah, along the underlying and then bought the put as a as a hedge. Okay, so so you know you know my game then too because that's I I like that trade uh, as well. Um, so I, I 
I, I, I don't, I've never heard that term before, so I'm gonna have to remember that term. But I, I, you know, looking at the historical chart here, just looking at the five-year, 30-day constant maturity, we're as low as we've been from a volatility standpoint here uh, in a while. And and as we've hit these lows in the past, we've seen uh, you know significant changes in the volatility on the upside. So you know, we trend much longer. It looks like just from you know. Obviously, history is all we have to look at. That we we might get a push up here in volatility, and and a lot of those a lot of those moves up in vol have come on breaks in the contract. But you know, maybe this time, can you see it going? I mean, how how low do you think silver can go? I mean, what's the lowest you've seen it um, go? Are we are we have we seen that in the last couple of years? The lowest it's been? I mean, in the in recent history. Yeah, so far this year, we're close to the lows of the year. We were a little bit lower in July. Uh, but in terms of uh, just in, in looking back to uh, historical silver, let me bring this up. Give me one second. I'm looking at the chart. But in terms of looking at historically uh, how we are in terms of the lows of silver, uh, we were actually roughly half of this, but that was in 09. And then immediately afterwards, silver went up to the uh, upper 40s. So uh, that was the case. Uh, in recent history, if we want to go back to about two years ago, we were in probably about $2 lower. And right. uh, before that, we would have had to have gone back, well, uh, the 2009 rally. And it, when it started in 2009 was the, the other low of it. So uh, we're at relatively low levels right now for silver, historically speaking. Now, it doesn't mean it couldn't go lower. It definitely could. But uh, we definitely are on the lower end of the spectrum. Uh, no one would doubt that. Right. So we would if we were if we were uh, analysts uh, looking at the stock market, we would would you say we're in an accumulation phase here for silver from a physical standpoint? I mean, really, it's it's if we're plus or minus where we are, it's probably a good place to be long that underlying is that was that would that be a fair statement for me yes but i'm a silver bull so uh I, I the way that i typically i guess um yeah it would definitely be a fair statement for me but i've always been a silver bull um i think just over the long term there's a lot of reasons why i think it will go higher and i think that's a good long-term holding to have in some way shape or form but uh on the flip side uh silver is not something that sits still uh you need to have some type of a hedge on it at all times as well i think Right. I, I mean, I think over the last couple, couple, three years, I've become much more of a physical bull just in terms of just as a as a, the, a divestment from the, you know, your standard sort of what we think of as in as investments and whether it be the stock market or whatever the case may be. So. So, yeah, these levels, I think I feel like at least from a personal standpoint, are good accumulation levels. And uh, and and again, if you go lower, you just look at you, you, you kind of dollar cost average if that's the case. But there's only so low, I would imagine that it can go. So. But we're going to keep. Uh, I, I I learned something today. I learned the married put. Okay, so and 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 the cover call. So you're doing. Uh, so when you do your. So, just to kind of wrap this up on the collar. So when you when you do this collar, you're sort of you're you're treating both ends of it from a hedge standpoint. If, at least that's what I gather from your from your explanation. Yeah, I'm trying to, uh, for the term that uh, Andrew Giovinazzi uses, do stuff. Uh, in that, uh, if the if it if it were to, if it goes down lower as it has, that's an opportunity to buy to cover uh, the short covered call or the short call, uh, and then um, possibly roll the put out. I'm not at that stage yet, but uh, changed from being a collar position to just a married put position to where being long the underlying, long the put, uh, and then as it goes higher then uh, possibly sell the covered call again and uh, go to the well twice if possible. All right. Well, I, I like that. I, 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 this is sort of a, uh, a dynamic collar. So uh, this is, this will be, and, and this is, you know, it's funny. I don't know if you realize this part of the reason it puts quick skew together was to sort of give the relationship between the, the 25, del obviously the 25 Delta call, the 25 Delta put is the one we focus on since that's sort of the one everybody talks about. But the whole idea the quick skew is so you could see how the collar sort of breathing, you know, if it's got a deep breath, it means it's very wide. There's a big disparity between the, the call and the put. And if it's narrow, it's contracting and, and maybe it's not so interesting. So, um, you know, that was just, it, it, it it, it seems like a nice thing to sort of marry together. And, and I call it the quick skew trade, which is um, it's doing the collar, but how, how I think of it is, is hedging it with the, at the money. Okay. So you're basically doing a put spread and a call spread. So you're, you're, you're selling the expensive out of the money, buying the, 
cheap out of the money and then hedging it with a synthetic. And the reason I like that was, is you can, you can sort of do it without having to do the underlying and now you just have put spread and call spread. So anyway, that's Got the it. thought, that's the thought behind quick skew. So, uh, Let's see, we're approaching, uh, we have a few, we got about 15, 20 minutes left, but let's, you know, the, the elephant in the room. What's the elephant in the room today? What did we? Uh, let me see. Uh, um, some coin exchange thing. I, Bitcoin. Oh, yeah, that. Right. So we got the elephant in the room is the Bitcoin. It's all, and I tell you, this is when I know it's gone. Well, again, going too far, who, who knows? Everybody wants, I think everybody would love to see it come down. I think everybody but the people that are along it, and I think the people that want it to come down are people that didn't get in it early, right? And I, I go back and tell, you know, I've been, Mark and I talk about it, I, I've been doing a little dabbling, but very, very small. Mostly, you know how you, it's one of those things that if you don't do something, you don't pay attention to it, right? So I had to do some stuff so I so I could pay attention to it. So it forces you sort of look at prices and, and look at trends and look at the other cryptos that are out there so you can get familiar with the, you know, the reason behind the different cryptos and like one does one one is used for banking like Ripple and then there's one for Ethereum which is like for computing time and then there's Litecoin which is transactional right and then um, and then there's Bitcoin which you know it's getting to the point where it's so expensive to complete the transaction it's not necessarily a good you know high le high frequency transaction thing now it's become more of a you know a store of value <laughs> so you know it got I got involved and just so you can start paying attention to it but when I start seeing, you know, I uh, live in the suburbs and when I start seeing emails from the financial planners in our town talking about how to get involved in Bitcoin, it scares. I, that's when I get scared, right, is when you when you start to uh, and, I, and I think that's a, I don't know. I don't know what you think about this, but everybody's sort of gotten and maybe this is the whole market numbing news numbing thing. Right. If you told somebody two years ago, hey, I can I can get you a. Uh, 10% return annually for the next 10 years, what do you think they'd say, right? They'd be, I'm, I'm ecstatic, right? Because if you tell me that's going to happen, but now if people aren't seeing something doubling or tripling, they think it's a bad investment. So I think that's kind of, a, at least in my opinion, from just being, trying to approach it from a practical standpoint is, you know, people are looking at the returns that, that, the, that some of the cryptos are getting and they're just thinking that they're missing, well, some are missing the boat, but it's, it's one of the, it, it's not, it can't be sustained, right? There's, it just not something that, you can't have a parabolic uh, price forever. No, I would agree on that. And, um, you know, the fact that uh, I have, um, I have fielded at least 6,000 phone calls in the last couple of weeks on Bitcoin from clients and people alone, I'm exaggerating, but good gosh, it sure feels like it. Um, and uh, just the fact that everyone's talking about it tells me that uh, it might, who knows it could go up to a hundred thousand. You never know. Uh, but I think it's gonna. It's. I don't think it's gonna end well. When it ends, that I don't know. But when it does end, I don't think it's gonna end well. And for a few reasons. Uh, the first reason is that at some point in time, the people that control regular currencies are. If they want to, they can put the kibosh on this in one way, shape, or form. So let's say that the U.S. government uh, decides that they don't like this Bitcoin thing. They can either, you, by using legal ramifications or simply by the fact that they have lots of money, if they want to manipulate the Bitcoin market, they can. And uh, they can make this thing go tumbling down at any point in time should they choose to. Uh, the other reason uh, for my thoughts on Bitcoin looking to come down at some point uh, is that how do you ever have a Bitcoin split? Um, can you trade things in? Uh, so like if a stock were to go up this high, uh, they'd likely have a split of some sort. Uh, but I don't know if it's even possible to have a currency split of some sort. I wouldn't even know how that would work. Uh, so that's another concern. And then the final one is just, like I said, everybody, uh, I have some clients who are very sophisticated, some who are not very sophisticated. And um, all of my, I love all my clients. Um, and I'm not just saying that. I've been very blessed with the best clients ever. Um, but everybody's talking about it right now. People that are very, people that stare at the charts uh, looking at three-minute charts and call me if uh, they don't get every tick and people that don't even 
look at a statement for but maybe once a year are calling me on it. Uh, and whenever you have uh, people like that talking about a certain underlying, I, I can't think of any time in history that it's ever ended well. Um, so with that being said, uh, we were talking about yesterday on the option block. I think the way that I'd actually want to play it is uh, once we actually are able to trade options on it, I would love, 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 love to buy a vertical put spread on it. Uh, just to, I, I wouldn't want to short it because it, I think you'd be a fool to short it, just go outright short on it right now, just with the, everything that's been going on. Uh, but if you have limited risk and you're buying a put spread and I'm willing to bet it'll be a put spread because at some point options are going to come out on these. Uh, and if you just buy a straight long put on that, I would imagine the vol would be about somewhere near 6 trillion, I think, <laughs> who knows? Um, so it'd likely be pretty expensive vol, but if you buy a put spread on it to kind of hedge off the vol a little bit, you can have a bearish position on it. And quite frankly, I can't wait to play in that, not necessarily with client money, but at least with my own, um, in terms of buying a put spread on Bitcoin at some point, if we ever do get options on it, which we will in the near future, I believe. Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> You know, we obviously we saw the the SIBO did their XBT contract, so they're trading the Jan, Feb, and March. That started on uh, Sunday, and I think everybody who was involved in the market or is involved in the market was sitting uh, at their computer, whether it be at their office or the. I was sitting at the counter in my kitchen, watching and seeing and and sort of lamenting that the SIBOs uh, uh, couldn't get to the SIBO price page for a while until they kind of beefed up uh, some of the. Uh, servers over there, but um, you know, generally speaking, a, a pretty good launch for that. Uh, if people aren't aware, or if you if you haven't been reading about it, that's a, a, a single coin contract. They're trading uh, three contracts, right? The Jan, Feb, and March. There was a, a, a fair amount, a good volume. I think the best volume day was uh, Sunday night, Monday. Um, they don't have good like historical charts on this thing. I've been trying to talk to them about using Quick Strike, but that that's another story. Um, but uh, I think that's the first day was our best day from a volume standpoint there. Uh, again, today we're looking up, you know, it's, I think it dampened the, the price movement quite a bit. Although the last couple of days we've been up about, right, today we're up about 1,250 in the future. So it, uh, there was, uh, it, it, I think it did, it stopped that, it stopped that like really skyrocketing uh, up price. And I think that was the whole intent of uh, anybody who who wanted that to be in the market. Now, coming up uh, Sunday night, we're, we're going to see the CME's uh, uh, BTC is going to be the symbol. Uh, that contract is going to have um, this week, it's going to it's going to have a Jan, Feb, March and a June. Right. So it's going to have two serials and two quarterlies. But the thing I like about Mike, the thing I like about the, the CME's contract is um, they're also going to trade the spreads. And I think personally, um, you talked about options. Now, I, I believe I've been saying all along a couple of things I've been saying all along and I've been trying to put them out there. Not that I just because I, I, I don't want to ever go be the guy to go back and say, you know, well, I said that, but I've been putting it out there and I put it on social media and I've been saying it and sh say, saying it in shows. At first, I was curious as to why the CME chose five coins. But then, you know, it's more because I think it's it's going to be more of an institutional contract where they need, you know, so there's a bigger contract to, to, to manage bigger risk. And then the thing that kind of struck me was it makes sense to start with the big one, like the S&P is five times as big as the mini. So the next thing you're going to see, I think, is the, the BTC is going to be a BTC mini coming out of the CME. And that makes total sense. So you go from five coins down to one coin. And I don't have any inside information, but I've been peppering everybody I can over there saying, is this going to happen? Is this going to happen? I don't get any answers, but that's my guess. I think we're going to get the big contract like you have, and then you're going to see the mini contract. So they're going to get the institutional with the big one and, uh, and they're going to get the, the retail with the little one, the one coin. And I still think, I don't know much about the SIBO, but it just seems like CME has got the, got the edge when it comes to the, the futures. Um, as far as options go, uh, again, not knowing anything, but just sort of pure conjecture. Um, those are those are obviously going to come very soon. I, I can't imagine. I think that's a little bit once you get the future and to see what the volume is. It's typical uh, of an exchange release to do the underlying first and then to follow it up with the options contract. So you see if it's uh, worthwhile from a volume standpoint and then you immediately follow it up with the options. So those are going to come. But, Mike, the thing I like and the thing I think is going to be awesome is is the spread. So, you know, this spread, I think, is going to be very uh very much where you know you get a rally, the the back month is gonna 
push up higher than the front. You get a break, it's going to go the other way, right? It's going to be sort of like the sky is falling. The chicken little thing is like, okay, this spread's going to widen up because we're going to keep going because it's bullish. Or it's going to, or if you see a big tank or you see a big spike down, you go, okay, now the end is near, so now the spread's going to widen. So I believe that you know there's CSOs, calendar spread options on a lot of these commodities. I think, at least I would think, that's going to be an attractive trade as well. So. We're going to see those options. I think the big question is whether going to be if we're going to see calendar spread options on the on the Bitcoin future spreads, because I think that's the one place where SIBO missed the boat. And I think the CME now we didn't see a lot of trade in the in the deferred contracts in the SIBO it was very little. But part of that is, I think, is because it's, you know, you're doing two different legs. You can't do the when you can do the spread together. Obviously, you get a much tighter market. Markets are pretty wide on the outrights. So um, that's kind of my kind of my uh, prediction there. What do you think? I mean, do you like uh, like the idea of the calendar spread options? Do you think it's viable? And what do you think about the whole mini contract following up the five coin contract? Well, I definitely think it'd be viable and, and, and a very doable thing. And uh, yeah, I would agree if history would repeat itself in terms of how like you have the S&P, you have the big contract, and then you have the E-mini with the smaller contract. Uh, definitely uh, a very possible thing. And, uh, you know, the other, the other reason I think that uh, the uh, mini contract uh, has been so popular in the S and P is the fact that there's still the day trader rules that exist with uh, on the stock side of it. Um, I think that's one area to where uh, the SEC really helped the the futures world just by having that rule, and then the uh, the people uh, in the futures world took advantage of that. And I think that's another reason for such popularity on it because uh, it's a definitely a lot easier to day trade. I don't think anyone would argue with that. Uh, so I would like to see that uh, if we if we were to have a big contract and a mini contract um, uh, for the, the spreads on them, I think that would be a great, that would be great if that could work, if that work bleh, as that works out. And um, I think this is going to be a lot of fun to watch. I'm just kind of looking at a two day chart of uh, Bitcoin on the SIBO. And uh, over the course of the last couple of days, I'm showing it as low as uh, uh, 16,500 and then uh, as high as 18,600. So um, if that doesn't get your heart going, then quite frankly, you have to check your pulse. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that that's a thing. It's like we've we've just grown. And I think it goes back to your initial comments. It's we've grown used to seeing these ridiculous percent moves uh, in this contract that people are just sort of, you know, they're drawn to it, right? Because we just haven't seen it before. So, uh, so like we said, keep in mind, you know, now the SIBO is going to have a little bit, I think, I think it, the CME almost benefited from having the SIBO go first. At first I thought it was, you know, maybe you know, would they miss the boat on this, but I think it almost benefited because they got to see that there were some problems with the site and, and those kind of things. So I think that those things are going to get beefed up uh, for Sunday night. So, You'll just to kind of elaborate on what's going to happen on the CME. There's, they're they're kind of tout. You know, this is something that people are going to have to wrap their heads around as well. They're kind of touting it as the Bitcoin Real Time Index, which is the BRTI, and then they talk about the BRR, which is the Bitcoin Reference Rate. In the end, they're really one and the same, right? Because the BRR gets set off the Real Time Index, but they're initially treating it as two two reported items. So what you'll see is. Uh, we just released some quick strike tools on the CME website for Bitcoin. And if you go to cmegroup.com slash quick strike and then go into the single asset class section, you'll see that we have uh, there's a Bitcoin pricing tool down below. And you'll see you'll have the ability to go to to see the, the intraday and the short term um, uh, minute charts for uh, the BRTI, the real time index. And then you'll also be able to go to the BRR tab to see the set, which is more or less it's a reference rate. You can think of it for all intents and purposes as a settlement uh, as well. So those charts are out there and you can look at them and uh, the, they're out there now. Um, you will get a better version of them that's going to be released uh, this weekend as well. But uh, that's going to, you're, you know, not only on the homepage, you're going to be able to see those prices, but you'll be able to see the charting and, um, and uh, go back in time. I think there's one year worth of history in the, in the uh, reference rate, uh, high or low, open, close that we that we have loaded out there now. So I think it goes back to uh, 12, 18 uh, of December of last year. So you're going to have a place to look, and 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 that's really the thing about these indexes, Mike. I think that you know I, I go on a bunch of different exchanges looking at it, and you have so many disparate prices. This this index, SIBO index, is on the GDAX, right? So that's one exchange uh, number that it's tracking. This this uh, 
this reference rate is on four. And I think GDAX, uh, and th I don't even know that, I'm not sure the names of the other ones, but GDAX is one of them. Um, so there's four there. And then there's another exchange called Terra Exchange, and they have nine in their index. So I think the more indexes that get put into these reference rates that are then tied to these futures contracts, then you're going to get more of a sort of a, a price discovery stability uh, when it comes down to people, uh, you know, being able to be comfortable with the prices they're paying or, or, or where things are in that market in particular. So, you know, like everybody else, I'm looking forward to it and uh, can't wait to see, um, see if we have any movement. I just, what I really want, obviously what everybody wants is just volume. You want to see trade, you want to see volume, you want to see some movement. So it'll be fun to, uh, again, we've been saying it over and over again, it'll be fun to watch. Uh, and see what happens this weekend in particular. So Sunday, Monday, it's going to be um, exciting to see if there's any drop off in the in the vol volume over at the SIBO. So, all right. So we're almost uh, we're almost at the end of the rope. There, we have five more minutes to go. We should probably look at our uh, at some user questions. We'll see if we have anything here. Uh, let's see. All right, we already talked about that a little bit. Um, we talked about Mark Clyde. Brian asked about who's listing few, uh, options first. I think uh, that's going to be. Don't know. Don't have an answer to that. I'm guessing that they're both. They've both been thinking about it. CME came out of the blue. Um, you know, one one uh, one of the leadership said we're not going to do Bitcoin right away, and then the next thing you know, there was an announcement that they were going to do it. So uh, I'm going to guess that CME is going to have them on the heels pretty quickly. But there's nothing in the security definition files or anything like that so that's showing options have been defined or available. That's one place you could always look and see, and you could also always get access to the to that to that product file over on the CME Group website. If you go to Quick Strike Tools again, there's a product browser. You could type in a symbol, and you can always see what stuff is either trading or what's going to be trading within the next two weeks. So that's one way to get an idea. Um, and let's see, what do we have here? Uh, we got a question from Knack. I'd like to show uh, with the quick skew updates, what's the best way for me to take advantage of that information? Should I be trading risk reversals? You know, Mike, you talked about it. You know, when you, when you I mentioned to you, gave you a little bit better definition of what quick skew is. So, right, if you have some way of relating between the call and the put, which you would probably be a decent way to take advantage or to put on a risk reversal or, or those put spreads or whatever. What do you say about that? Oh, I think that's a, a that would be a great tool to, to look for it, to look for the skew, to see exactly where you want it, what contract you want, what month you want, what strikes you want. I think it's, that is a plan. Yeah. So, Go out there. You could take a look in, embedded in Quick Strike Essentials, which is the free version of Quick Strike uh, on the CME website, is uh, a tool called QuickVol. There you're able to get historical data for one month. Included in that is uh, one month of Quick Skew. So go out there and take a look. If you need more than that, you can give us a call, and uh, we have history back uh, through the beginning of 2011 and soon to the beginning of 2007. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing if you have any questions about that. And then finally, we'll try. we got two minutes left. Um, question from B98. Uh, I know straddle runs are a big thing in indexes. Don't hear them used in ags or metals, though. Why is that? Well, I see uh, I, I'm on a couple of broker emails for the ags, and I see straddle runs get pushed out. Um, I think what happens is in the euro dollars and in the treasuries, when I was back in the pit, you know, you saw straddle runs all the time because it was a way for people to sort of set their term structure uh, for the contracts that were trading. Um, I'm not so sure how much they did it in equities. Mike, you could talk to that if you got any insight. But uh, from the um, any market that I've ever seen and any brokers that I ever talked to, they're always doing straddle runs. And straddle runs are a way, you know, when you talk about volatility in a contract, Everybody knows you have a volatility curve, but when we're talking about levels, the levels they're discussing is always around the at the money. Therefore, that's why you would use the straddle run. So it's giving you sort of the, the most active, most liquid contracts level of trading from a volatility standpoint. So they're, they're metals. You know, I don't, I don't know much about that market, I, uh, but I cannot believe that when it was when it was very active, there weren't people calling down to give me a run. And it also could be. Um, in the indexes because, you know, it used to be that there weren't that many contracts that traded in the euro dollars. You had a bunch of them that were trading and then they were liquid. So people had to, had to get the run so they could see where vols were because you couldn't watch all of them. So Mike, what do you, what do you think? How, the equities, did they do that? Did they do straddle runs in there too? Or is not so, not so popular there? I'm not so sure about that. Hard to say. I mean, it's not part of my everyday world, but um, with that, uh, it's definitely something to be aware of. That's for sure. 
Okay. All right. Well, Mike, thanks a lot for filling in. I appreciate you taking the hot seat. So, um, you know, my seat's been hot the whole time because I've been bouncing around hoping I can do justice to Longo, but uh, we hope he feels better. And uh, again, if you, uh, um, well, Mike, what do you got to say to close up the books? Hey, appreciate it. Thanks for letting me come onto the show today. It's always fun to uh, be on TWIFO, but uh, if anyone ever is interested in a financial advisor who's not afraid of the word TWIFO, give me a call at 312-212-3531 or shoot me an email at mtosaw at rcmfs.com. All right. Well, thank, thanks again, Mike. Uh, everybody, again, go pay attention out to uh, cmegroup.com slash quickstrike or bantix.com, B-A-N-T-I-X.com to you look at all the tools that we offer but uh have a good weekend watching bitcoin futures get released to cme and we'll talk to you next week this week in futures options is brought to you by quick strike options pricing and analysis software quick strike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy to use web-based interface View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. QuickStrike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about QuickStrike at Bantix.com. That's B A N T I X. Dot com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at QuickStrike1. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 